Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter to everyone. A very special word of welcome to everyone at the Ascent. And a special word of welcome to everyone at our Union Cross campus. And along with everyone else who will be coming under the sound of my voice through any form of this digital communication, are you ready for some good news? Jesus is alive. And because he's alive, it means that everything has changed. The first man, Adam, was born such that he could live forever, but he died. Jesus is like a second Adam. He's really God, but he's really human. And though he could live forever, he chose to die so that you and I could live forever. We're going to look today at a story that is tender and beautiful and curious and in the end extremely inspiring in its deep, deep implications. It can be read on many different levels. It's in John. It's chapter 20. Jesus has been crucified and a wealthy man named Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate if he could take the body of Jesus and place it in a tomb. And Nicodemus, who had come to Jesus by night, also was with him. And they taken a lot of spices and ointments with which to anoint the body. And Mary Magdalene, along with Peter and John, have come on Easter morning, the Sunday morning early, to um, uh, come and continue the work of anointing the body. And the stone's been moved away. The tomb is empty. Peter and John run back home, and Mary Magdalene is there weeping at verse 11 of John 20. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he said these things to her. It was at first a case of mistaken identity. I was uh, uh, amused thinking about how children have mistaken ideas about God and it got me reading a bunch of stories this week about how children say the funniest things and uh, comes to trying to understand God. The first though is really was so cute. This uh, child said to her mother, uh, when are we going to kill the eggs? And her mother said, what, what do you mean, darling? Kill? When, when are we going to kill the eggs? Well, well, I don't know what you mean, sweetie. What do you mean? And the little girl said, you know when we put the color on the eggs. And the mother said, oh, oh, you mean when are we going to dye the eggs? <laughs> Children can get confused about almost anything uh, when it comes to the scriptures. They hear things and they just try to make sense of it best they can. One child thought Noah's wife was Joan of Arc. Another child thought Lot's wife was a pillar of salt by day and a ball of fire by night. (laughs) One child said that Moses went to the top of Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. Another child was very confused and thought the Seventh Commandment is thou shalt not admit adultery. (laughs) And uh, one child said a Christian should have only one wife, and that is called monotony. Uh, Children can get confused uh, about how to pray and what we are praying. And One child must have been scolded for having played too many video games because the little boy is praying the Lord's Prayer, 
and got it wrong and, and, and said, lead us not into PlayStation, but deliver us from evil. We, we had a child in the first church I served, a little boy, his name Brandon. And one day he asked his mother, said, why is God so tired all the time? His mother said, tired? God's not tired. Why do you say that? He said, because that song we sing, he is exhausted. He is exhausted on high. <laughs> I, one time, this is true, one time I was walking through that church I served, first church I served, and little children were filing their way they're out with their teacher. They were going out to the playground. And I walked by and said, hi, children. And she must have been three years old. little girl looked up at me and just said, hi, God. <laughs> Case of mistaken identity. Well, this story of Mary Magdalene, it first seems like it's a simple case of mistaken identity that she thinks that he is the gardener. But what I want to show you today is that at a deeper and ironic level, Mary was right that Jesus is very much the gardener. And I want to tell you why. I want to tell you why we need him so much and why the fact that he's the new gardener is such, such good news. Let's start with who Mary Magdalene was. She gets her name from the town of her origin, Magdala, which was a Galilean town only a few miles away from Capernaum. It was known for how they made clothing there, and it was thought to be, according to historians, a prosperous uh, city. And we get the impression <clears throat> that Mary herself uh, had means. She, I uh, think, helped support Jesus' ministry. She, we are told in Luke chapter 8, was delivered of seven demons, that Jesus healed her of very much. Maybe it's because it's in Luke 8 and in Luke 7 there's a mention of a sinful woman who anointed Jesus' feet that there has been a misrepresentation by many preachers over the centuries that has said that Mary Magdalene is that sinful woman. And some have even said Mary Magdalene was a prostitute and all of this. There's no uh, mention of any of that in the Gospels. Instead, what we know of Mary Magdalene is that she was someone who Jesus had healed very much. We don't know how all of this terrible spiritual warfare that had been going on in her life had manifest, um, but whatever anxieties, whatever troubles, whatever problems, whatever confusion that she had had because of the, uh, the attack of the devil in her life, Jesus came and set her free, and she loved him so very, very much. She was one of the women who dared to be at the cross to see him flogged and then nailed to that Roman cross and crucified. She was there watching as he hung in pain. She could not leave him because she just loved him so much. The thing you need to remember about Mary Magdalene is that she was a woman that loved Jesus deeply. And that's part of the reason that she was there on that Sabbath morning, that, that Easter morning after the Sabbath. Here's the way the events had transpired. She, along with other women, witnessed Jesus be flogged, carry his cross, and then be nailed to that cross. At noon it turned dark as Jesus is hanging on the cross. At 3 o'clock he gave up his spirit and he died. It is the day, that day Friday, called by the Jewish people the day of preparation because they're preparing for the Sabbath. Because a faithful Jew would not work on the Sabbath and so there could be no work done and that included um, preparing, anointing, burying a body. And so they wanted to accomplish all of this before Sabbath at sundown. So sometime between 3 in the afternoon and sundown, Joseph of Arimathea has gotten permission. They get Jesus' body. They get him laid in the tomb. They have all of these anointing oils and spices. And yet they cannot complete their work because Sabbath comes and they're to do no work. And so they spend the next 24 hours grieving, doing no work. And you can just imagine how sad Mary Magdalene is. And the thing that's on her mind is how she at least wanted to be able to show proper Jewish burial. She wanted to follow the customs and show honor to the body and anoint Jesus' body and care for that 
body that had been so mutilated and so it was on her mind. As soon as Sabbath was over, early before the sun arose on Sunday morning, she is at the tomb and Peter and John are there. They look, the tomb is empty. Peter and John go back to the house and Mary is forlorn because the one thing that she wanted to be able to do was at least fulfill her sense of caring duty to to anoint Jesus' body and she is there weeping. And in the midst of weeping, she encounters these angels who must not be in their full resplendent glory because she doesn't seem terrified. She's just sad as the angels uh, say, why are you weeping? And in that moment, as she looks into the tomb, what she doesn't realize, is the resurrected Lord Jesus is right there behind her. He's alive and he's there in that garden. You can meet God when you least expect it. In the sad times of life, in the ordinary times of life, when you aren't even looking for him, he may reveal himself to you. And so Jesus speaks to her and says to her the same question of the angels, but he adds another. Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? What are you sad about? What is it that you are longing for in your life? Where is your point of deepest need? What is the real problem in your life? And whom are you seeking? To whom are you going for answers? To where? To what are you looking in order to try to solve the deepest problems of your life? Jesus asks her these questions and Jesus still asks these questions Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? What what is your point of need? What have you missed? What are you grieving? Is it a love that you never received? Whom are you seeking? Where are you going to look for life? Jesus asks her. She only hears him, though, at a literal level. And she says that she's looking for the body of Jesus and supposes him to be the gardener, assuming that the gardener would be the only one who would be there that early in the morning, probably the one who owns the garden, who has, for some reason, removed the body and taken it somewhere else. It's interesting, there's much uh, Christian art, including Rembrandt's famous painting on this scene, that depict Jesus with a wide-brimmed hat and a shovel in his hand, as if he is the gardener. And the fundamental question that is hanging in the balance for Mary here, and for all of us, is... Is there any chance that this man standing in front of me could be the resurrected Lord Jesus? You know, you wonder why she didn't recognize him. And scholars say, well, perhaps it's because uh, he was in a resurrected form. You know, some of it is just, have you ever seen somebody in a setting that's all of a sudden different from where you normally see them? It happens to me all the time. Like if I see you at church, it's one thing, oh, but if all of a sudden I just see you at the golf course or something, it takes a little moment to go, wait a minute, how do I know you? Who are you? What is it? You ever had those kind of moments? And so part of it was she just didn't recognize him because she would have never expected him because she thought Jesus was dead. Interestingly, a little parenthesis here, I, I stumbled this week into reading a blog of an atheist. I'm not recommending that you spend time reading atheists' blogs. 
But every now and then, I just kind of enjoy it because I, I like, you know, just want to hear what the other side's saying. And this was pretty comical. I laughed out loud because this uh, fellow who had written, uh, he was an atheist, and he was recounting about a time when his, uh, he had a uh, little boy who was small. And even though they were atheists, he said, I'm going to take him to church on Easter because Easter's such a big deal. Let him see what goes on. Well, lo and behold, they went to church, and the, the minister had one of those moments with the children up front. We have a little children's message and invited all the children up front. And uh, the minister had all the children. It was Easter day, and the girls got their Easter dresses on and everything looking so cute. And he said, what's today? And all the children said, Easter. And they said, and who do we celebrate today? And they said, Jesus. And then he said, and where is Jesus now? And the, the little boy who belonged to the atheist just blurted out and said, Jesus is dead. Well, the minister tried to recover. He said, well, yeah, I, I know he's, he, he died, uh, he was crucified, but because of Easter, now he's resurrected. So he's not really uh, dead anymore, he's resurrected. And the little boy just blurted out louder than he did before. He said, no, I'm pretty sure he's just dead. <laughs> I don't know how you recover from that. Kind of puts a damper on your Easter children's message, doesn't it? But it highlights the question. Is he dead or is he alive? There's no in-between. You can't be just sort of dead or sort of alive. And everything in Christianity hangs on this question. And everything that makes the gospel good news depends on this question. Because if he's still dead in a tomb decomposed Middle Eastern tomb somewhere, then Paul says our preaching is in vain. We don't have any good news. But if he's alive, it changes everything. Mary, at that moment, could not envision Jesus being alive. And so she thought him to be the gardener. And there is Mary thinking that what she needs is just to find Jesus' body so she could do her honorable duty and anoint the body and care for it. But when Jesus says, Why are you weeping? he knows. He knows a thousand layers deeper than Mary's own heart knows. That what she is longing for and what she's weeping over is that she had placed all her hopes in this Messiah. She had been healed of so much and she had envisioned him reigning in a kingdom and everything being different for the rest of her life, and now it seemed like it was all gone. And he knew all of that. He knew why she's weeping. He knew what she really was looking for was something that was too good to be true to her, that she really wanted to find that Jesus was alive. Somewhere down deep in the heart of every man and woman, boy and girl, is a longing for God and I think we spend so much energy covering it up when we're lost in so much superficiality. We don't know how much it is that we need God. But Jesus knew. And she said, thinking he's the gardener, if you'll just tell me where he is, that's really all I want. But Jesus like, no, you want a lot more than that. And all it took was one word. Because it wasn't just any word. It was her name. He would have said it in Aramaic. Miriam. And when she heard Jesus speak her name and looked into his eyes, Every hope and longing in her life was satisfied in that moment. 
There's nothing more wonderful in all of life than to have God call you by name and know when you hear your name that Jesus must be alive. This is, by the way, how faith comes. We have an inner longing. Something in us is seeking an answer. And God calls. When you don't know how to figure it out, God calls, and he calls you by name. She heard her name, and she just erupted with joy. Rabboni, teacher, it's really you. And so, she must have thought, he's not the gardener, he's Jesus. But what she didn't realize is that he is Jesus, and she was right. He is the gardener. I say this because they're in a garden, and it is not by accident. John makes much of the fact that the tomb was in a garden. And anyone who understood the Hebrew Scriptures knew that the whole story starts in a garden. It starts in Genesis chapter 1 at the very beginning. When God created Adam and Eve, he put them in a garden. We read about it in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he formed. And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So God made a garden. He put Adam to the garden. And there were two particular named trees, a tree of life and a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 10, a river flowed out of Eden. Eden was the name of the garden, to water that garden. And verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. This word work, it means to till the soil and keep means to guard it. He's to work it and he's to guard it. Adam had a vocation. He was a gardener. The first man was a gardener. He was in a garden. He was to work it. He was to keep it. And, verse 16, the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of the, every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat it. For in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. God also made Eve, and they were one. And we read about in chapter 3 how a serpent came into the garden that God had made and deceived the woman. And he said, did God really say you'll die? And the serpent said to her, verse 4 of Genesis 3, you'll not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And so the woman thought, Here's a way I can be more like God. I'll be more blessed if I do this thing. And she eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam eats of it. And this disobedience brings sin into the world and causes them to be ashamed and they become afraid of each other and they become afraid of God and they cover themselves up and Paradise is lost to them because of it. So Adam was a gardener. He was supposed to work the soil and guard the garden. And the first thing you should do to guard the garden is don't let a serpent come in here and distract you. But he failed at his vocation. And because of it, they were... Banished. But here's what happened. Later in chapter 3 of Genesis, after speaking out how curses come into the world because of this sin, verse 22, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And 
your translation, probably like mine in the ESV, has a dash. It's the only place that I know of in the Bible where God speaks an unfinished sentence. He doesn't finish the sentence. Why? The thought is too unbearable. You ever have something you can't even speak it? It's too unbearable to even speak it. Because if God were to finish the sentence, He would say, now that He's sinned, if we let Him take hold of the tree of life and live forever, He'll be forever banished. He'll be forever condemned. What God was saying is that if in a state of condemnation in his sin, he now eats of the tree of eternity, he will be eternally in a state of sin, eternally condemned. And the thought is too much, and God can't even speak the words instead. Therefore, verse 23, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man in the east of the Garden of Eden. He placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. He said, until there is redemption, until there is a solution, until there is salvation, we cannot allow him to come and eat of the tree of life, lest he live forever in a state of banishment and condemnation and live forever in his sin nature. God had a different plan. Oh, God had a plan. And the prophets over the years would give glimpses of it and foretell it. And we would see in the scenes and the narratives of the scripture and the stories that are told, glimpses of it that would give echoes and shadows to let us know that God had a wonderful plan. And the plan of God was this, that since Adam and Eve sinned, And everybody ever since, therefore, is born in sin. God needed to send someone into the world who had no sin. It's like this. Every single person has, as their great, 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 a thousand times great grandparents, Adam and Eve. So we're all born in Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve were in sin, and so everybody born of them is in sin. When the Bible says we're all sinners, we're all born in sin, we recognize there's some people that seem to be really good people. Some people seem to be really bad people. We, we recognize that, that there are a lot of good things that people do in their lives. It doesn't mean if you're, if you're a sinner, it doesn't mean that you don't do good things. It doesn't mean you can't be a loving person. What it means is something more fundamental than that, is that we are born in this condition of sin. We're born in a world of sin, like fish in water. So you don't have to teach a child how to become selfish You don't have to teach someone how to become worried. You don't have to cause somebody to get trained in learning how to be able to lie or deceive or lust or gossip. These things just come what we might say naturally, don't they? And and so we are born in this kind of world and born into this sin. And the, the Bible says the real dilemma is, is that because of this sin, we're separated from God. Because God's holy, and, and, and we're born in sin. And because of that, there's, there's no connection. So we're like Adam and Eve, who've been sent away from the tree of life. And God, in His infinite mercy and infinite wisdom, had a plan. What He would do. Oh, even the angels wish they could have seen this ahead of time. Nobody could see it coming like this. It's because there was no one on earth that was righteous. And yet there needed to be a human being that was righteous. How could we as human beings ever be born anew into a new condition that's not just a condition of sin unless there was somebody on this earth, a human being, who was righteous, who never sinned. And God, finding no one righteous in the earth, for all are born in sin and fall short of the glory of God, sinned His only begotten Son to come and be that righteous person. You know what Jesus came to be? A new Adam. The first Adam failed in his vocation, sinned against God, and brought sin into the world. And so God, in his infinite mercy and wisdom, sent a new Adam. The Bible speaks of Jesus as the second Adam, 
He is, however, a victorious Adam. Let me put it more clearly for today's image. Adam was a gardener. And Jesus came as the new gardener, the real gardener. And Mary met him in the garden of Easter. How different the garden of Easter from the garden of Eden. It is a beautiful thing if you begin to compare the two. The garden of Eden, a place of life wherein death was ushered in through disobedience. But the garden of Easter, that tomb garden, a place where there was expectation of nothing but death, but life sprang up through the obedience of Jesus Christ. The Eden garden, man fell. The Easter garden, man arose. The Eden Garden, a place of truth that got invaded by a lie. But the Easter Garden, a garden in the midst of all the lies of the world which truth invaded. The Eden Garden, men and women hiding themselves from each other in the darkness. But in the Easter Garden, Jesus saying, here I am and coming close and drawing Mary near. In the Eden Garden, Eve was born without sin but became a sinner But in the garden tomb, the Easter garden, sinners, when they accept Christ, are forgiven of their sin and become saints of the Most High God. See, Jesus is the new gardener. He is the one who has taken up where Adam failed. He is... In one instance, addressing himself as the vine dresser, he tells stories of how the word of God is like seed that is being sown. And here is the good news of the gospel, is that though we were all born in the first Adam, anyone who would have eyes of faith to see Jesus, to hear his call and recognize that he's raised from the dead, anyone who trusts in Christ is the Bible says born anew you are you are born now in a new spiritual way and you are in the second Adam you are now born out of the righteousness of Jesus so there was a first gardener and there was a second gardener there was a first Adam and there was a second Adam and when you become a Christian you are simply the Bible says in Christ And so everything that Jesus as the new gardener has accomplished is yours in Christ. So Adam should have forbade the serpent to even come into his garden. He'd been given dominion over that garden and he should have forbade him, but instead he entertained him and he fell into deception. But Jesus, the new gardener, as he had demonstrated in Mary Magdalene's life, Wherever he saw the serpent, he said, get out. He is the one who has come to restore dominion. And what he's given to us, beloved, is that we are no longer banished from the garden, but instead we are invited to come and eat of the tree of life. Because when you accept Christ... He who knew no sin becomes your sin. And you, despite all the sinful things you've done, become his righteousness in God's eyes. The life of Jesus is given to you. In Revelation chapter 22, John saw a vision of the heaven. And this is what he saw. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. In other words, 
the first gardener failed at his vocation and caused humanity to be put out of the garden and away from the tree of life. But a new gardener has come. His name is Jesus. And through his death and resurrection, he has made it possible for anyone with childlike simple trust in him to be welcomed back into the garden of God and eat of the tree of life. He's a gardener, I tell you. He protects, he pulls the weeds, he plants the seeds, and he oversees it so it can grow. On this Easter day, I therefore invite you, strange as it may sound, let Jesus be the gardener who tends to your own heart. What are you weeping over? Whom are you seeking? Whatever your point of need, and no regardless of wherever you've been looking for an answer, Jesus is in the garden today. Listen. You'll hear him call your name. And that's the gospel.